we're going to take a journey through the cell. We're going to view all the organelles and their life processes. So if you could just follow along, you have the handout as a guide for the video. So next, the topic is biology. Biology is the study of living things. And so we're going to look at living and non-living things. We're going to look at how they interact with their environment. We will look at unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. Right. So in order to be characterized as a living thing, these are some of the characteristics you must have. Um, you must have a definite shape. There has to be, you, have, you must be made up of cells. You have to have a universal genetic code. Be able to acquire nutrients. Living things are complex. We have simple organisms, but they're made up of complex compound structures. They must have a finite lifespan, grow and reproduce. Living things must be able to respond to their environment. So all of these characteristics are carried out by different life processes. Okay. froze up again. All right, here we go. So life processes, the first one we're gonna look at is um, nutrition. All living things must be able to carry out this process. So um, nutrients mean you have to get the nutrients from your environment and then process the nutrients. So when you're taking the regions, if there are questions based on nutrition, you need to look for key words such as obtain from the environment. That's going to be your key to know that you're talking about the life process. So once again, if you want to add notes to your paper, you have the sheet and I'm following along. So any question on nutrition, look for obtain from the environment, take in or process. The trick will be to look for key words that's going to lead you to the definition or the concept that needs to be done. Another life process that we'll view is respiration. Many students believe respiration just has to do with breathing. But breathing brings in the oxygen that you need for respiration, for the process of cellular respiration. So respiration has to do with releasing energy from the food. So when you breathe in, you're taking in that oxygen that's going to help you carry out cellular respiration. So a key to look for again, if there's a question based on respiration, underline that word energy. You're looking for the release of energy. Transport. Transport is another life process. Transportation, meaning that materials are moving through the organism. Uh, if in this picture you could see as the plant is growing, molecules will move into the roots and through the plant. So materials can move within the organism itself, in and out of the cell, and also movement can be done in the process of locomotion. We will see that simple organisms such as a protozoan, they use um, cilia or maybe they use pseudopods, they could also use flagella. Those are different structures that can help them move. Growth is one of the life process. I mean, if you, in order to be considered a living thing, you have to carry out growth in some way or form. Growth just means increase in size. Most of the questions that you'll see on the test about growth will get right to it, to increase in size. Increase in size, cell size can increase in volume faster than the surface area itself. Another life process is reproduction. Organisms, and I'll use the word organism to refer to any living thing. So organisms must have the ability to make their own kind, to reproduce their own kind. So if there's a question again on basic reproduction, you're looking for keywords such as reproduce and own kind, making your own kind. There's two types of reproduction. There is sexual reproduction, and then there's asexual reproduction. And so in sexual reproduction, we're looking for uh, male and female um, processes. And in asexual reproduction, we'll see that there's one 
parent cell, and that parent cell will then give rise to um, a daughter cell, which will then be um, the offspring, and we'll touch on that. In life process, all the chemical activity that will take place in an organism is referred to as metabolism. And so, the key word to look for, it will be all the chemical activity. A lot of these are more detailed than they look here, so I'm just pointing out the key words that you're looking for. I've minimized the definitions to just focus on what key terms you look for while taking the test. And so metabolism, carrying out any chemical reaction, you will see that there's synthesis. The word synthesis, another key word, we see that show up in pho photosynthesis. We'll see it show up again in dehydration synthesis. And synthesis is when you're making something to create. You're going to use simpler molecules to create a more complex structure. Excretion is another life process that we'll cover, and excretion is where you're removing metabolic waste. So metabolic waste is the key term that you'll look for when answering a question on excretion. Right? So those are the main <coughs> life processes that a living thing, an organism, will go through in order to, in, in order to carry out life. So once again, this first half, well, first out of the three sessions, we're gonna focus on taking a journey through the cell. And the cell, there's the cell theory. The cell theory is the, the theory focus on the fact that all living things are made up of cells. Meaning it's the smallest part of any living thing. Whether multicellular, unicellular, the cell is the basic structure. The way that organism look is based on the cell itself. The function of that organism, all the different function that's carried out by an organism is based on that cell. The life processes are carried out by the different organelles inside of the cell, and they work together, the cells work together to form tissues, organs, organ system, in order to maintain all the system in the organism. The third part of the theory is that cells arise from pre-existing cells. So I want you to um, add to this section, there are exceptions to the cell theory. So on your paper, please add in that there's exceptions to the cell theory. Viruses are exceptions to the theory. Because viruses, they look for a whole cell in order to carry out their life processes. They cannot carry out the life processes I just showed you on their own. They rely on a whole cell to carry out those functions. A mitochondria is the other exception to the rule. A mitochondria cannot, uh, mitochondrias have their own genetic material. It's believed that mitochondria at one point existed on, it on, on its own and through evolution over time evolved to become a part of the cell. The two categories of cells can move on to the next page. Two categories of cell. You fall into the category of prokaryote cells or eukaryote cells. The prokaryote cells, these are the guys who have no nuclear membrane. They have no membrane bound structures in them. So examples of that would be our bacteria cell. Eukaryotes on the other hand is the one that we see the most and we talk about the most. Those guys, they have true nucleus and they um, have organelles. So here's an example of a prokaryote cell. So here you have the bacteria cell. Notice you don't see any mitochondria inside. You don't see um, no, any chloroplasts. What you see here, you have the nuclear information. You have the genetic information inside in the nucleoid, but it's not wrapped in the cell membrane in the way that you might be used to. The DNA or the genetic information floats on the inside of the bacterial cell. Eukaryotes on the other side, on the other hand, are the ones that we're used to seeing or we see the most, or you may have studied the most in class. There's two types. They're the plant cell and the animal cell. You take a look, you will oftentimes be given a cell structure 
to identify the different parts. So on your worksheet, I've added these in. So if you take a look at your worksheet, there are different structures to show you different ways the eukaryote cells can be shown on the exam. So some of the things that you should look for um, to differentiate between the two, in the, plant cell, in the plant cell, you need to look for the cell wall. That will be one of the things that will be used to identify that it's a plant cell. Also look to see that there's a chloroplast and usually it has a large vacuole. In the animal cell, we do not see the cell wall and the chloroplast. It has smaller vacuoles, but one of the things that we'll see if you take a look, it has the centriole. And all of these images you could get through Learn America. It's in the ebook and some of the images I've pulled from the videos. So you have access to this information there. So we're gonna go through the main cell organelles. Rarely are there questions on the test on the Golgi apparatus. Um, rarely do we see any questions specifically to the endoplasmic reticulum. And let me see if there are any other ones that we're missing. Yeah, so those two lysosomes, um, I haven't seen any questions on those, I wanna say in the past like 10 years. Uh, the ones that we're going to focus on today is where I've seen most of the questions. You need to be able to tell the difference between them. So you can see a plant cell once again, the cell wall. It has a large vacuole, chloroplasts, and there are no centrioles present. Whereas in the animal cell, you'll see the cell wall. They'll have smaller vacuoles, no chloroplasts, but you will see the centriole. Okay, so before I go on right now, we have a review question. So if we could hit the lights in your packet, if you're following along in light, live stream, this is page two. I want you guys to take a second and look at this question. So on this question, this is one of the free short answer questions you would see on the exam, on the Regents exam. There are, on the Regents exam, you will have multiple choice section. That's part A. Part B will be made up of a graph in section. You'll also see graph, um, besides the graph charts in that section. Then you'll have a read and comprehension section where you'll be given a paragraph and you have to answer questions about the paragraph. And then there's a section where you'll see all short answers, one sentence question. So let's practice one of those right now. So here are, here, what type of cell do you think this guy, this cell is? Animal. It's an animal cell. What, what let you know that it's an animal cell? Um, so, the cell and the so right away, you can identify, notice that those things are missing. So that tells you that this is um, an animal cell. Don't just rely on the fact that it's square or circular. Look for those specific things. So right now, I'm gonna give you some time while we take, let's start with structure one. Take a minute, structure one. First, I want you to identify it, then state the function. What do you think that function is? What life process would you associate that organelle with? And state how that structure would help the cell. So let me give you a minute. Thank you. Thank you. So take a minute to work on that. So it's on page two at the bottom. Let's do the first one. If you're finished with the first one, go on to the second. So those who are on live stream, you could, if you don't have the packet, you could answer these questions as you're viewing them at home. What's your question? Yeah. Um, a dot or a maze. 
All right, so that was your original question. So here, as you take a look, we identified this is an animal cell. Do you, this thing that it's pointing to, do you know what this thing is? Yeah, it's a ribosome and a endoplasmic reticulum. Right, so it's pointing to that dot on the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. So I guess I could get you started with that. What did you guys put for the first dot? For number one, what does it point into? The ribosome. So now that you know that, keep going. See, if you remember, what is the function of the ribosome? What life process would you associate it with? And how would that structure help the cell? Okay, let's go further with this one. So here, what function, what's the function? Do you guys remember? What is the function of the ribosome? What's the function? Right. So the site, the ribosome, is the site of protein synthesis. What life process is associated with the ribosome? So even if you have to go back and look at the first sheet, what process do you have? What do you? So take a look at the list of life processes. Which one do you think would be associated with? What do you think? Go ahead. Nutrition. So nutrition is taking in food, right? All right. So right here, we're taking simple molecules and we're making something. That's a chemical reaction. So you're looking for the one where you're actually going to, you're going to create something, a complex structure. Synthesis, all right? So that's the process that's taking place here. Um, and it was in the word, you guys said it for the second one, that it was protein synthesis. You're synthesizing, you're making, I know. <laughs> it's right there. You're creating something. And then the last one, state how that cell structure helps the cell. What do you get from protein synthesis? It's a trick again? No, it's in the word. What do we get from it? Yes, proteins. proteins. You're creating proteins, you'll get amino acids from it. All right, let's take a look at the second one. Number two, what's number two point into? Any guesses in the room? Nucleus. So right now, take another second, film. what's the function of the nucleus? What life process do you think it would carry out? And how does it help the cell? You guys remember what is the function of the nucleus? You remember? What's the purpose of the nucleus? What do you think? That's you're describing it, but what does it do? Mm -hmm. All right, so the nucleus that controls all the other cell activity. So if you weren't sure, you want to write that in? It controls all the cell activities. And we're gonna break down each section today. So what we're gonna see is that the process that it will carry out, it would regulate, okay? It's gonna reg regulate whatever process needs to be done in the cell. And as you said before, the way it's gonna help the cell is that it's gonna tell 
the other organelles what to do. For example, it will tell the ribosome to make protein. Let's go to the third one. Someone else, let's get a different hand for three. What is three pointing at? Does anyone know? What does it go for it? Say it loud. Thank you, mitochondria. <laughs> All right, so the mitochondria here, does anybody remember the function or pur purpose of the mitochondria? The mitochondria. Yes. Right, it provides the cell with energy. And so we're going to see the process of respiration will take, pl take place here. And it helps the cell by providing it with energy. Yes, question? Yeah, what was the life processes associated with the nucleus? The nucleus, it's gonna regulate, so it's regulation. All right, so let's go on to our first structure as we're go journeying through the cell. So the first structure we're going to look at is the cell membrane. The cell membrane, oftentimes, you'll see it listed as the plasma membrane. So when you see plasma and cell membrane, they're talking about the same thing. So once again, we're now moved on to page three. Two main things you need to know about the cell membrane. You need to know the structure, what, it, what is it made up of? You need to be able to identify it. And then the second part will be, what is the function of the cell membrane? So here, as we take a look at the cell membrane, there are two layers to it. It's made up of lipid bilayer, because there's a top layer, and then there's the bottom layer. So there's two layers. So you have a lipid bilayer, and then here we have proteins embedded in the cell membrane. So the two things that the cell membrane is made up of are lipids and proteins. Guarantee to see questions on those. There are always questions in some way about the structure of the cell membrane or also called the plasma membrane. And so if you're in the upper level, uh, maybe an honors class, uh, you would talk more about what each, each protein, there are different types of proteins, and they carry out each function. But since the Regents is made up to, for all students of all levels to take, you won't see any questions um, specifically as to the function of each. You may see it in a reading passage on the test where it's already described what each one does, and then they'll go back to ask you questions about the basic structure or function. So just keep in mind lipids and proteins. And then as we go to the function of the cell membrane, the function of the cell membrane is to transport materials across the membrane in and out of the cell. So there's two ways that materials can transport across the membrane. There's passive transport and there's active transport. So for the first half, we're gonna look at passive transport. Passive transport is where no energy is required to go across the cell membrane. And so we see that in diffusion. Diffusion is when molecules move from an area of high concentration into an area of low concentration. Right, so imagine, let's say, you guys ride your bike around the neighborhood, yes? You guys still do that? You think about this. So you're riding your bike and you're at the top of the hill. Do you have to put any energy in to get to the bottom of the hill? No, right, you pretty much just coast down. So in diffusion, molecules are gonna move from an area of high concentration to low. There's no energy to move it across the concentration gradient. Where we'll see in active transport, you go in the opposite direction from low to high. Facilitated diffusion is when the proteins, those proteins we spoke about, the molecules are gonna move from high to low, but they'll move through the proteins themselves. So we have molecules moving through the lipid area. They'll go from one section to the next to get in or out of the cell, but some will actually pass through the proteins themselves. And so facilitated, meaning that it's going to help the molecules to go across. So I wanted to review one of the state lab, sorry, the part D on the 
exam, on, you will see questions on the four state lab. One of the state lab that you guys did this year was the fusion through the membrane. You guys remember doing that? So let's do a quick review of the fusion through the membrane. So in the fusion through the membrane, you had to create um, a semi-permeable bag. Do you remember what you put inside of it? Starch solution. Starch solution and there was something else. No, not inside. Starch and there was another compound, glucose, right. So starch and glucose were placed inside the bag. Once you put that, then you add to get a beaker of water and you add iodine into the beaker. Then you place, this is coming back to you guys, then you place the bag into the solution and you would let it sit for a little while. Then this is what you would see afterwards. The bag would change color from this clear color to, or clear or white, could be described as, to a bluish black color. And so there it is by itself. So we went from here to here. So the question is, how did this happen? Why did the bag go from clear to a bluish black? Do any of you guys remember? What do you think? Uh, I Right. Iodine here is a starch indicator. Whenever it comes in contact with starch, it changes from, here's its diluted color of amber, to blue-black, indicating that starch is present. So as an indicator, but take a look. We placed the iodine in the water on the outside. We didn't place it in the bag. So how did the bag change color? What do you think? Do you remember? Do you remember? Hmm? It diffused. Remember, we have a higher concentration of iodine molecules outside, and we don't have any inside the bag. So the definition of diffusion, moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So the iodine then diffused into the bag. Once it diffused into the bag, what did we say was inside the bag? Starch. So once it diffused into the bag, it reacted with the starch, turning it blue-black, proving that the molecules move from an area of high to an area of low concentration. Now, glucose was in the bag. Did, how do we know, did glucose, oh, before I go on, did starch come out the bag? How do we know that starch didn't come out the bag? Right. If starch had diffused out of the bag, then the water on the outside at the end would be blue-black, the same color. So now the question is, why didn't starch move out since there's a high concentration of starch? What is it? It's a complex, it's a large molecule. So size, that's the other thing. Size will also affect um, a molecule moving from an area of high to low concentration. Now the glucose come out the bag. Can we tell? No, not from this picture because this is a starch indicator. So we can't tell if glucose came out the bag. How would we find out if glucose came out the bag? We, we have to test to see. So here's the next test. My students actually did these. They were so happy. I took pictures for you guys. Here we go. So um, here we took a sample out of the surrounding liquid. Place it into a test tube. Then we performed a glucose test. And a glucose test is done with the Benedict solution. So we did a few drops of the Benedict solution into the same thing here, into the liquid. And so we see the blue because of the blue from the Benedict solution. What do we have to do with this? Do you remember? Yep, we have to heat it up. That's how you get the reaction. So here, I didn't take a great picture of my hot plate here, but here's the hot plate. It's heated up. Do you remember what color Benedict changes to in the presence of glucose? Yeah, it's bright orange. So it could be a bright orange or a yellowish color, anything in that range. So for us, I've gotten the all range, and so this is what we got. We got more of the orange today, but I've seen the bright, um, the brick red, I'll say, before. So this is a quick review of the state lab. You will have questions based on this. And now why did glucose diffuse out of the bag? 
Do you know why it came out? But still, why didn't starch come out if there was a high concentration? It's a smaller stuff. Right. So this here, glucose is a smaller molecule, so it was able to diffuse out through the selectively permeable membrane. What? Right? Quick review. So this is a, um, an example of how you would see it on the state test. So this would be a before picture. And so what I want you to do at the bottom of page three, why don't you take a second and write what would the after picture look like? So take a second. Yeah. Oh, you could put it here. On the board. Yep. Yeah. Oops. Let me erase some chemistry going on here. Okay, so here we go. So this is your before. Let's draw our after picture. Here's our bag. Okay. Iodine. Do we have any on the outside? Yes. Yeah, at the end, after. So how many of the eyes should I move into the bag? Two. So why am I moving two in the bag and leaving two on the outside? We want to, the fusion occurs until it reaches a state of equilibrium. And so the molecules will move until they're at equilibrium. Starch, how many should I move out of the bag? None. None. So how many do we have in the bag? Four, five. All right. How about glucose? It's in the bag? Take two out. Take two out. So that would be your final answer. So this is one way that you could see the lab presented on the exam, okay? Or sometimes they'll give you the final product and they'll ask you to explain why it moved in the way it did. Any questions on this, guys? All right. Another type of uh, diffusion that we saw, or you may have done an activity on this, is osmosis. Now, osmosis is the same as diffusion because energy is not required. But this time, it's the movement of water from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Whereas before, when we spoke about diffusion, we were talking about molecules. We saw sugar, we saw iodine move, but now we're going to focus on the movement of water across the membrane from area of high to low. So another time that we saw this was in the lab. You remember this one? This is the second part of that diffusion through the membrane lab. So here, the regular picture of the lab. So this was the red onion that we saw under the microscope. You must be able to identify the different parts under the microscope. So here, you should be able to identify, let me try this again. You know what, I might just work with this. Here, you should be able to identify, I gave you guys a picture of it, so you have a section to write in, we're on page four, to add notes for yourself. So you need to be able to identify the different parts under the image in the microscope. So you need to be able to identify, here's the cell wall. You need to be able to identify the red section, just the perimeter of the red. That's your cell membrane. What's the stuff on the inside? Might know what's that fluid on the inside? Cytoplasm. Okay? Every year there's a question associated with this, um, this part of the lab. So now, does anybody remember what happened? Well, how do we go from this phase to this phase? Do you? Right. You added salt. 
And so what the salt solution did was created a, a hypertonic environment. And so what that meant was it ended up where there was a low concentration of water on the outside of the onion cell. And there was a high concentration of water inside the cell. And what, based on what we know about diffusion, what's supposed to happen? It's supposed to move from an area of high to low. And so when the salt water was added, creating this environment, the water moved out of the cell, resulting into what we see here. So you need to be able to identify the same parts in the after picture. So here we go again. Here's your cell wall. Here is your cell membrane. Oops. And there's the liquid inside showing the cytoplasm. So you need to be able to draw the after picture and you need to be able to identify the three main parts in this diagram. This is, process is also referred to as plasmolysis. So plasmolysis is where like a plant loses water. You could see it um, when it gets wiltered or um, it feels wrinkly or um, wiltered. That is the best way to describe it. That's showing that plasmolysis occur, meaning that the water is moving out of the cell. So now there's no turgor pressure against the cell wall, so it's not as rigid, and that's why it feels wiltered. Now, what can I do to return this to the original state? Well, before you get to that, if I just wanted to turn this back to this. Mm -hmm. I would have to add distilled water to it in order for it to return. So the only picture we don't have because it's not a part of the lab, but this idea is mentioned when we talk about animal cell, is in a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution is where you have a cell and it's placed in an environment where there's a high concentration. So I left space for you to write this in. There's high concentration outside than there is on the inside. So since there's a high concentration of water on the outside, which direction will the water diffuse in? It will go in. And so as water move into the cell, it will actually get increase and can eventually lysis, which means it can actually burst. So we see more questions on hypertonic solution when they're talking about the animal cell. There'll be red blood cell questions based on hypertonic solution and ratio in that example. Right, any questions on this, guys? Right, so that's a quick review of the state lab on the fusion through the membrane. Okay. All right, oh, I have this, there's another picture I brought in for you guys. This, just to show you what it would look like in an animal cell. Since the lab focuses on plant cell, um, did you guys do this one in class with the egg cell? No? So this one, we removed the shell from an egg and we placed it in a hypertonic solution. So in a hypertonic solution, remember there is the concentration of water is less on the outside, high on the inside. So water diffused out. So the egg actually shrunk. We actually got to see that the water moved out of the cell. So I wanted to show you what it would look like in an animal cell, something that would represent a cell membrane in comparison to the one you saw before with the animal cell. I'm sorry, with the plant cell.
All right, so the opposite of that is active transport. So go back to the scenario I gave you guys about riding the bike around, riding your bike around the neighborhood. Once again, if you're at the top of the hill to get down, do you put any energy into it? No, you're just gonna coast down. So that's like the fusion. You're gonna go from an area of high concentration to low concentration, no energy needed. You're just gonna coast. But if you get to that hill, you know that one hill in the neighborhood, you have to go from low to from the lowest point to the highest point of the hill. Think about how much energy you have to put in that. It's the same thing with active transport. To go against the concentration gradient, to go from low to high, energy is required. You had a good break, All right? So let's, um, we're gonna do just a quick review of what we just covered in um, a few short videos. All these videos, again, um, it's on Learn America, so you have access to it by logging in there. Bricks, which are used in construction, are the basic structural units of buildings. Let's try that again. Similarly, cells are the basic structural units of living organisms. Buildings are constructed in different shapes, sizes, and designs, but the bricks used are made up of the same materials and are similar to one another. Similarly, there are many types of living organisms, but they are all made up of cells. Cells are complex living structures and often are studied using a microscope. From this video, you have learned about the cell. Okay, so that's one of the sections that we've covered, just a quick review of what cells are and their function. So then from the cell, we um, are focusing on certain structures of the cell, and our first structure is the cell membrane. So you could see in this animation, um, the cell membrane, there are different size molecules that will diffuse across the membrane. Um, they're passive transport, so they don't need energy to move from the area of high to low concentration. As they move, we're viewing the concentration gradient. So this could be uh, molecules moving in and out of the cell. They have to get across that cell membrane. So this is just to give you a sample of what it would look like. So because there's a high concentration of it on one side, the molecules are just gonna naturally move. And as they move, they'll move to an area, almost to get more room, move to an area of low concentration. So they'll go against the, over the concentration gradient. And it will move until it reaches equilibrium.
All right, wait till it finish, go all the way to the end. So equilibrium is when there's a balanced amount on each side. All right, let's go back to our question. It's not our question. Here we go. The arrow is representing active transport. What's the difference between active transport and diffusion? Give me one. Active transport uses energy. Energy is um, used. What's another one? Um, it against, the concentration. against going from an area of low to high concentration. Does anybody know what B is pointing to? It's used for communication. Yep. The receptors. Receptors. That's another important thing that the cell membrane is able to communicate through receptors. So we're looking at the cell membrane function as a um, function to transport things. Allow, it's semi-permeable, allowing things to move across the membrane. And also that it has receptors to aid in communication. How about this one as a practice question? At the end, which ones would be on this side? The dark color ones or the larger circles? Starch or glucose? Glucose would be on this side. So you'd have even amounts. Starch would stay on that side. All right. So let's keep it, keep it going. As we look at how cells are made up, cells are made up of organelles. We've viewed some of the organelles already. Those organelles are made of chemicals referred to as macromolecules. Those macromolecules are made up of micromolecules, and those micromolecules are made up of elements. So here are the most common elements that we discuss in living environment. These elements, we could go in the opposite direction, make up micro to macro organelles in the cell. So the idea of using small substance to make a larger substance, what process is that? Who's got it? Synthesis, okay? So let's take a look at these micro and macro molecules that make up the organelles and they're found throughout the cell. Some are in the category of, of organic compounds. Others are in the are in organic compounds. These organic compounds are made up of carbon and hydrogen. An example of an organic compound here is glucose, which we do talk about a lot. Uh, glucose is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So the fact that it has that carbon in it proves that it's an um, organic compound. Most of the times you're going to look for carbon and hydrogen together. Whereas an inorganic compound, you could have one or the other, but most of the time you do not, you will not find them together. Carbon dioxide can also fall into this category, but it's an inorganic compound. All right, let's keep going. Water. Water is a major element. It plays a major role in all the chemical activities in our body. What life process is described by all the chemical activities that occurs in our body? What's that life process? Good. And so water plays an important role. Let's take a look. Water function in synthesis. As far as the reaction where two molecules are bonded together, water has to be removed in the process of synthesis. So if we're creating a molecule, water is going to be removed. In hydrolysis, hydrolysis is when you break that large molecule down. Water is then added in that process. So let's take a look at the most common ways that we, uh, we could see this happen. Organic compounds such as carbs, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins are four common organic compounds that are discussed on your test. Carbohydrates are the main source of energy. And examples of that would be the starches, and your sugars. So as you're following along, um, those on live stream, this is going to be page six of your packet. So the categories of carbohydrates. 
monosaccharide, such as glucose, one molecule of sugar. Disaccharide is where you have two molecules of sugar. So like sucrose, sucrose is your regular sugar at home, has two molecules of sugar. Polysaccharide is made up of many molecules of sugar. So we see polysaccharide when we discuss starch and cellulose. Cellulose is found in the cell wall. Now here, let's look at the hydrolysis and synthesis of some of these macromolecules. So we have carbohydrate here as a macromolecule that can be hydrolysized or broken down into simple sugar. And so the way that when carbohydrate gets hydrolysized, water is added. You can go in the opposite direction where you take two simple sugar, combine them to perform, to create a carbohydrate. And that's referred to as synthesis. So water is taken out for synthesis, whereas in hydrolysis, it's added. So if you, to fill in your chart on page six, go ahead and write in the building block for carbohydrate would be simple sugar, such as glucose. Another macro, oh, before I go on to that, when you're taking the test, here are some key words to look out for. Sugar, if sugar's mentioned in the question you're looking, you're thinking about carbohydrates and the fact that it breaks down into simple sugar. Words ending in os, glucose, monosaccharide, disaccharide, your starches, polysaccharide, cellulose, amulose, glycogen, fructose, maltose, sucrose, and lactose. So these are key words as you're reading, you come across a question. If you see any of these, I want you to think right away to your carbohydrates. What? The next macromolecule would be lipids. Lipid, an organic compound. Um, these are your fats and oils. So here's lipid as a macromolecule. Can be broken down into three fatty acids and glycerol. Same thing, you could use three fatty acids and glycerol to create a lipid. So you could add that to your chart, as in these are the building blocks for lipid. Nucleic acid. These are nucleic acid are DNA, is your DNA and your RNA. And so these structures are made up of nucleic acid, which makes up your, which is made up of nucleotides. So the basic structure of your DNA would be a nucleotide. And our last one on the list are proteins. Proteins, we're gonna discuss protein when we talk about enzymes, hormones, antibodies, hemoglobin, aiding in cell repair. Proteins make up a lot of these structures or are involved in any process of them. The primary building blocks of proteins are the amino acids. They contain an acidic carboxyl group and a basic amino group, hence the name amino acid. Each amino acid is made of five components, a central carbon atom, a hydrogen atom, an amino group, a carboxyl group, and a side chain. The first carbon is a part of the carboxyl group. The second carbon to which the amino group is attached is called the central carbon. This central carbon atom is joined by covalent bonds to four different groups, therefore it is usually an asymmetric carbon. R represents the side chain, which may be a hydrogen atom, or an aliphatic, aromatic, or heterocyclic compound. So that's just showing you that there are different types of amino acid. You, um, 
won't be asked on the test about what the carboxyl group is or the amino group, but you need to know that proteins are made up of amino acids. Proteins, main function, proteins are um, determined by their shape. Proteins are based on their composition, what they're made up of, how they're made up, and they're also based on their biological function. Proteins are also classified into categories. They could be dipeptide, two molecules of amino acid, and then polypeptides, many molecules of amino acids, which we saw in that video. So the main thing that you need to remember for the exam is that protein, when broken down, will be broken down into mi micromolecules such as amino acids. You can use amino acids to make a macromolecules such as protein. Enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts. They're made from protein. They are protein. They help to increase or decrease specific chemical reactions in your body. So they control chemical reactions throughout the organism. Let's take a look as to just a reminder as to how the enzyme structure works. The lock and key hypothesis of enzyme action was postulated by Emil Fischer in the early 1890s. According to this hypothesis, a substrate binds to an enzyme in the same way that a key fits into a lock. Each enzyme is highly specific and acts only on a single substrate. The substrate binds to a specific region of the enzyme called the active site. The active site of an enzyme is complementary to the substrate and forms an intermediate site called the enzyme-substrate complex. The enzyme-substrate complex then rearranges itself to generate the product. The enzyme is now released and is used for converting another molecule of substrate into more of the product. So to hydrolyze a compound or um, take it through dehydration synthesis, an enzyme will be involved in that process. So you saw where there were two small molecules, the enzyme um, combined them to form a larger molecule that synthesis. So in all those processes, an enzyme is required to carry out those processes. Right? There are things that can influence the enzyme and um, the substrate, the way they combine. And we could see there's the active side, it fits directly in, but there are three things that can influence it. Temperature, pH, and the concentration of the substrate or enzyme can influence how that combination will actually work. So here are, is another clue to how you'll remember some of the enzymes. Most of the times the enzymes are end in, in ACE. So for example, starch, the enzyme for starch would be amylase. For lipid, it would be lipase. For protein, it would be protease. Here are the three things. Let's take a look. As temperature increase, you could see that the enzyme reaction will go up until it reaches its optimum point. So these are discussed more than anything about the enzymes as far as what can influence them. So temperature, you guys have this chart, you could fill it in. Temperature influence how the enzyme will work. So the enzyme can only work at up to an optimum temperature. What will happen is the temperature will actually change that active site, avoiding or decreasing the chance of the substrate connecting to the enzyme. How acidic or how basic the environment is for the enzyme also determine how well the enzyme would work. So we see in your intestine, in the digestive system, you have different enzymes that work at different points of your digestive system and the pH is different along the digestive tract um, to activate, <clears throat> excuse me, to activate different enzymes. So what I need you to be familiar with are these charts. You should be able to identify this chart as in that's temperature. 
here's pH influence, and here is how the substrate can also influence how it works. So before we get to that, um, let me see if I have any practice questions here. Nope, I don't. All right, let's go here. It's a practice question. Cardinals are birds that do not migrate, but spend the winter in New York State. Many people feed these birds sunflower seeds during the winter months. Explain how the starch present in the sunflower seed help the cardinal to survive. In your answer, you need to, sometimes you'll see on the free respond question, it will say write a paragraph but include these points. The best thing to do is just go to the point and answer specifically. You don't need to put it in a paragraph format. So go ahead, identify what's the building block for starch. What's your building block? What'd you guys put? Give you a second. All right, so building block meaning what makes up starch? Do you guys remember? Or you could go back. Simple sugar is good. Next is light. identify the process used to produce this building block. All right, think about it. What process is used to produce these building blocks? Yep. Uh, so synthesis means you're making. So if you're going from starch to glucose, digestion. digestion, good. Digestion, breaking it down, or you could have said hydrolysis. Stay one way cardinals use these building blocks to survive. What do they use it for? Energy. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> what is X represented in this model? Good. This is the enzyme. And here is the organic compound that it's going to break down into two simple products. Explain why a substance X would not be likely to digest a different organic compound than this. Why wouldn't it digest a different one than the one that's in this picture? It has to fit together like a lock and key. It has to connect here. So um, if there was a different organic compound, it would have a different shape, and this wouldn't be able to um, break it down. All right. Here's another question. We have different enzymes are secreted in each, in three different locations in the mouth stomach and small intestine. Take a look, we have different temperatures, different pH. So this is a different way that you can see the question being asked on the test. So let me give you a minute to just process that.
Right. One got a chance to try these. All right, let's take a look. State how the activity of pepsin would most likely change after it moves from the stomach to the small intestine. So it's moving from here to here. How would it change the activity? Notice we're going from one pH to the next. What would happen? All right, so, it's, uh, so what we would see either would stop working or the process would slow down. Support your answer with the data. And so you could see here where in the stomach it's at one, a pH of one, which is a strong acid. And here it would go into a low base environment. How would a fever at 40 degrees Celsius affect the activity of the enzyme? How do you think a fever would affect? So now is a question based on temperature. What do you think in the back? Right, and you could see that it works properly between the range of 36 to 37. So anything above that, it would be too hot. So think about that graph. It would be on the slope of the graph, so it would slow down or stop the function of it. Identify the characteristics of enzyme that prevents pilin and trypsin from digesting the same type of food. Why would the, this enzyme what prevents them from digesting the same kind of food? The shape of them. Right, they have different shape because they're specific to what they'll work on. Good job, guys. Okay, let's move to our next organelle. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so our next organelle is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the site of cellular respiration. And so cellular respiration, this is where you get your energy from. We're going to see energy, re energy represented as ATP in this section. And so ATP, if we take a look at this image, ATP is a high molecule, energy molecule. And what happens is you will release energy from ATP. A phosphate molecule will be released, releasing the energy. The ATP then turns into ADP then once the phosphate is added back, this is from energy from the food that you consume, it then turns it back into ATP. So ATP is the energy you store up from eating. You'll use that up. The way you use it up is getting rid of one of the phosphate. Then once you eat and take in more energy, you convert it back, the ADP back into ATP. So here's food energy added. You're using the energy. It changes to this, then you eat, add more energy, and the cycle continues. Wow, look at this. There's two types of respiration. There is aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So here's a quick look. When the cell, when glucose enters into your cell, it goes into the cell and it goes through this process called glycolysis. It changes glucose into 2-pyruvic acid. This is all taking place in the cytoplasm. Two things can happen. If there's oxygen present, it goes through aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration will then take place in the mitochondria itself, and there are two processes that take place there, the Krebs cycle and the electron chain. So when you're taking the exam, you're looking for aerobic respiration, taking place inside the mitochondria. You're gonna get the most energy, ATP molecules, from the ATP, I'm sorry, from the mitochondria through aerobic respiration. If there's low or no uh, oxygen present, your body will then go through something referred to as anaerobic respiration, creating a process of fermentation. So in your body, lactic acid fermentation takes place, and that's when you get uh, muscle fatigue. So when you start feeling that pain in your muscle, that's because lactic acid is building up. Other organisms go through this process also, such as um, bacteria, yeast, and that's how we make cheese and yogurt. Alcohol fermentation, I'm sorry, for bacteria, that's cheese and yogurt. Alcohol fermentation is when you have yeast go through anaerobic respiration. And so you produce a lower level of 
energy from anaerobic respiration than you do from aerobic respiration. So to remember for the test, aerobic respiration occurs in the mitochondria, producing many molecules of ATP. Anaerobic respiration takes place in the cytoplasm, creating fermentation, whether it's alcohol or lactic acid fermentation, and producing less molecules of energy. Right, so here's aerobic respiration. Cellular respiration is a catabolic process in which food is broken down to produce energy in the form of ATP molecules. In plants, this energy is used in the process of photosynthesis as well as in the breakdown of sugars. Cellular respiration takes place in three different steps, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Glycolysis takes place in the cytosol of the cell and does not require oxygen. Here, glucose is broken down into molecules of pyruvate. It is done by the phosphorylation of the 6-carbon glucose molecule with the help of a phosphate group from an ATP molecule. This makes glucose chemically active, converting it into an isomeric form of fructose. Through a series of enzymatic reactions, the fructose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. So that's all in the cytoplasm. After several enzymatic processes, pyruvate is ready for the next stage of reactions. During the process of glycolysis, there is a net gain of two ATP molecules and the release of two water molecules and two NADH molecules. Those are hydrogen carriers. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria from the cytosol in order to enter the Krebs cycle and eventually the electron transport chain which will require oxygen. Before entering the cycle, one molecule of carbon dioxide is removed from each of the two pyruvates to in order to form acetyl-CoA. This is done through a series of enzymatic reactions. Acetyl-CoA goes through another series of enzymatic reactions in the Krebs cycle. Two complete cycles produce four carbon dioxide molecules, six NADH molecules, two ATP molecules, and two FADH2 molecules. The final stage involves the electron transport chain, the major site for the production of energy-rich ATP molecules. This last stage is carried out by a series of electron transferring proteins located on the inner mitochondrial membrane. Electrons are transferred and added with protons and eventually accepted by oxygen, the final electron acceptor, which then produces water. The ATP is formed by the proton motive force, which is driven by the movement of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. 30 to 34 ATP molecules are formed as a result of this process. And there was an additional two from the glycolysis process. So let's take a look here for anaerobic respiration. Once again, you just saw aerobic. This is anaerobic. Um, you see lactic acid is an example of something that would be produced in this process, lactic acid or alcohol. Let's do another practice question. This is a free respond question from the regents. What is structure X pointing to? What is structure X? All right, go ahead and write that in. Keep going, state the process that's performed in this organelle. What is it? Good. Respiration. Yes. Good. Respiration. Respiration. What are the two raw materials? What's needed for respiration? 
the two things that we need, it needed to diffuse into the cell for, cell, for respiration to occur. Glucose. Glucose is one. What else do we need? No, that's how the glucose is changed. What else we need for aerobe? No, that's what's made also. Glucose and the oxygen. oxygen. Those are the two raw molecules that's needed. Identify the molecule produced by this organelle and explain why it is important to the organism. What molecule is produced from cellular respiration? ATP, and what is ATP used for? Good. Energy. All right, let's quickly move on to the chloroplast, which is our next organelle. So here's an example, a picture of that plant cell. We're going to take the chloroplast, give you a zoomed in picture here of the chloroplast. When you look inside the chloroplast, there are these disc-like structure referred to as thylakoids. A stack of them is referred to as a grana. The space around them is referred to as a stroma. And so in the process of photosynthesis, the first step will take place in the thylakoids. This is, what's the green color that's found in these? What is it called? Chlorophyll. Good, chlorophyll. And so what we're going to see is that the light energy from the sun will get trapped in the thylakoids. And the photosynthesis, there's two processes to it. There's light reaction, where the light is dependent. Based on the light, the reaction will occur. And then there's going to be a dark reaction. And so here's a sample picture from the state test showing you the two processes for light reaction, what would be going in and what's coming out. So to go in, what molecules do we need to go into the chloroplast for photosynthesis? Sunlight. All right, so we have sunlight is one. What's another, the other two? Water. Water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. No, carbon dioxide water. Yeah, okay, here we go. The light dependent reaction. This process takes place here in the thylakoid themselves. <coughs> and so what happens is that water that enters in is actually going to get split. It's referred to as photolysis. So if I split water, so if I have H2O, H2O, if I split it, what two elements do I get from it? oxygen and hydrogen. So that oxygen actually leaves, the oxygen is one of the byproduct of photosynthesis. That hydrogen then becomes a part of the Calvin cycle. It's picked up by the Na, NADPH, that's the hydrogen carrier. It then brings it here where carbon dioxide will be going in carbon dioxide, those hydrogen ions, will then create glucose. So on this side, this is where glucose, sugar is produced. On this side is where photolysis takes place, releasing the oxygen. So you have a light and there's the dark reaction. So it's referred to as light dependent and then light independent. These are some factors that can influence it. The amount of light a plant gets can influence the rate of photosynthesis, the amount of carbon dioxide, temperature, and water that's involved. So here's a comparison of the two. Photosynthesis, we're gonna capture and store up that energy. Where in cellular respiration, you'll release that energy. Photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast, cellular respiration in the mitochondria. The things needed for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water, what's needed for respiration is glucose and oxygen. What's made from photosynthesis is glucose and oxygen. What's made from cellular respiration is carbon dioxide and water. Do you see any relationship between the two as far as their reactants and products? Do you notice a pattern? Yeah, what do you think? 
right? They're reliant on each other. So in a plant cell, carbon dioxide and water that's needed is produced by the mitochondria. That's another way that, it's, um, that it can get the carbon dioxide. Uh, products such as glucose and starch, the plant makes glucose and that glucose then goes to the mitochondria to carry out cellular respiration. Right, so it's using the sugar that's made. So plants have a mitochondria and chloroplast. Let's do another practice question. Based on photosynthesis. This is on page 10. Okay, so let's take a look. First off, uh, photosynthesis, which organelle does it occur in? Chloroplast. What are the two raw materials needed? What are the two things needed for photosynthesis? Molecules. What do plants need? Light. Uh, so true, light is needed as far as the molecules. Water and? Carbon dioxide, right? Uh, as far as the compounds I meant to, meant to say. Uh, next, identify the energy-rich energy molecule that's produced. What is produced from photosynthesis? What do you make? Glucose is the molecule. What is glucose used for? What process do we see? It for respiration, right? And so then uh, state how a gas produced by this process is recycled by nature. What gas is produced by photosynthesis? Oxygen. Oxygen, and how is that used in nature? We breathe it in, okay? All right, here's another question that I like, um, a region's question. Take a look, here we have carbon dioxide. It goes through a process to create a simple compound. So carbon dioxide and water, what compound do we know that they make? Guys? What compound is made? That's mine. Carbon dioxide, water, what's the compound? Who's got it? Glucose, that's the compound that's made, All right? So glucose can be, can form a complex structure. What complex structure did we learn about or review today that is made from glucose? Com compound structure made from, this is the building block for it. It's a building block. Glucose is a building block. For it. Glucose, if you break it down, you get simple sugars. What is it? Starch. Starch. Okay, so here I'm going to break it down again. Here's my glucose. And as a result, we get what's left. So let's answer these questions. Identify one type of organism that would carry out process one. So what process takes carbon dioxide, water, to make glucose? 
right? So what type of organism would carry that out? Any plant, all right? Or your producers or autotrophs. Explain why process two is essential. What's happening here? We're going from starch to glucose. What's happening to the starch? Right, so what process is that? You're breaking it down? So your hydrolysis or a digestion. Why is that important to humans? Why do we need to break it down into small molecules? So it's small enough to diffuse into the bloodstream. Process three, take a look. Glucose goes through a process to give carbon dioxide and water. What process is that one? Respiration, good. So then what would X be if that's respiration? Good, great. All right. So guys, we've covered all of the major cell structures. The one that we did not cover tonight is the nucleus. The nucleus, I'm going to include it in our next session because it's involved in reproduction and life, um, and reproduction my, through mitosis and meiosis. So I'll recall, I'll pick up where we left off today, but merge that into our next section. Thank you for coming out tonight, and I hope to see you guys again next time. Expert teachers and educators at Learn America have created an online platform that helps students better prepare and improve performance in standardized tests in math and science. Step 1. Our unique methodology involves taking pre-assessment tests. Students take pre-assessment tests to determine their skills, knowledge, and readiness required for taking a course. Students are provided a detailed progress report at the end of the assessment to determine their strengths and weaknesses, and areas to focus on in order to achieve higher success in the course. Students access the courseware through the Learning Management System, or LMS, that is available anytime, anywhere, either through a browser or through the apps for the Android or iOS platforms. Students will have direct access to instructors, view any posted course announcements, and view a calendar of upcoming course events such as homework due dates, assessments, and so on. They may also download a learning report detailing any of their course activity, such as assessment scores, anytime. Step 2. Personalized learning plan developed based on the student's test scores in the pre-assessment test. The LMS includes an ebook for each course that provides theoretical concepts broken down by chapters and topics. Each chapter includes diagrams, graphs, or animated videos to provide visual demonstrations of the theory. The LMS platform has several features to make the learning process easy. Students can highlight important information, take notes, use the online calculator, and unit converter. Our expert teaching staff has created an extensive question bank that provides self-assessment questions in the form of quizzes after every chapter. These tests provide students a quick assessment of what they have learned in each topic or chapter. Students get to view the results immediately and provide an instant view of what specifically needs to be revisited prior to moving to the next topic. Step 3. Adaptive assessments and formative updates where students then experience a series of assessments. Formative assessments are configured to reinforce the essential concepts behind major topic areas and to prepare students for more rigorous assessments as they march towards exam readiness. The assessment results allow students a full 360 degree view of the courseware to reinforce the learning and step-by-step -step detailed solutions to reinforce problem solving abilities. Faculty will use the formative assessment results to further guide the students. The students are then put through a more challenging adaptive assessment process. Much like progressing through a video game's levels, students climb the competency ladder by mastering one concept at a time. The adaptive assessments culminate in a mock final exam covering the complete course. Step 4. Interactive Moderated Online Forum. Students get an opportunity to participate in online discussions. 
Here, they can post questions and share information with other students taking the course, as well as faculty and teaching assistants. Step 5. Progress Report and Intense Interactive Review Dialogues. We provide a detailed, personalized progress report to view course progress. Students may participate in faculty-led review dialogues. This is conducted either in person or over an online conference. Step 6. Ready Review. Towards the end of the course, as their test approaches, students take a final summative assessment that details specifically what sort of outcome they can expect from their exam. With this assessment, students can dig deeper into what they need to know. Practice exams are available anytime and can be taken any number of times.